On July 26, 2015, at approximately 1 p.m., a criminal element intentionally detonated an improvised explosive device in the central grandstand of an international sporting event in Central Florida. After a very, very short investigation, it was quickly determined that that improvised explosive device was actually a radiological dispersal device, commonly referred to as a dirty bomb. There were several thousand victims involved. A detonation of that type with a radiological dispersal device, that immediately becomes a matter of national security. There are many, many partners involved, many federal agencies involved in the response to, the investigation of, and the mitigation of that type of an incident. Of course, one of the major players is the United States Healthcare Network. There are several partners involved in that network that immediately come into play. Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center is deeply involved in three of those partnerships. The Healthcare Preparedness Program, the Radiation Injury Treatment Network, and the National Disaster Medical System. The Healthcare Preparedness Program is operated and sponsored by the United States Department of Health and Human Services Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. The goal of that program is to simply strengthen the healthcare community's ability to manage surge cases and to be prepared for healthcare crisis in the local, state, and federal communities. The Radiation Injury Treatment Network is operated in conjunction with the National Maradona Program and it's a network of 75 hospitals, uh, core donor centers, and collection sites that are specifically designed to manage marotoxic injuries that occur as a result of uh, a radiation poisoning, or it could be certain chemical poisoning, such as a mustard agent that would cause uh, a marotoxicity. Typically, the hospitals that are involved in this program is a cancer center uh, and does have the capability of doing a uh, bone marrow transplant. The National Disaster Medical System is a network of over a thousand hospitals across the United States uh, that operate in partnership with four federal agencies. Uh, those agencies are the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, of the Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, the intent is to create a network of hospitals that can receive patients from any disaster site that has overcome that local community's capabilities. Uh, for example, we saw the National Disaster Medical System used heavily during Hurricane Katrina. Patients were evacuated from the hurricane area into NDMS hospitals across the United States. In this type of an incident involving a radiological dispersal device, the NDMS would partner with the Radiological Injury Treatment Network to evacuate the affected patients out of the ground zero area where it is very likely that the medical system in that area has been overcome. The NDMS has access to the military for military transport flights. They also have a network of buses, ambulances, and so forth to transport these patients. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs handles most of the legwork that's involved in moving these patients from point A to point B. Once the patient arrives at the uh, patient reception area in the, in the receiving township, it becomes the responsibility of the receiving hospital to, to manage that patient care just as though the event happened in, in their hometown. Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center is a partner with the Radiation Injury Treatment Network and with the National Disaster Medical System. Uh, we have agreed to receive patients from these high impact disaster sites. That makes it incumbent upon us to practice, drill, and constantly prepare to, to meet our end of the agreement. Uh, in the scenario that happened on June 26, 2015, 
uh, there was a need to seek radiation injury treatment for patients who were suffering from marotoxic injuries. Uh, we were activated at approximately 6 o'clock in the afternoon by the Radiation Injury Treatment Network. Our incident command team stood up on Monday morning and the unique thing about this type of a disaster activation is you're not going to receive the patients the minute the, the event happens. In, in this type of a scenario, you more than likely are not going to receive patients for seven to ten days. And it's a very unique opportunity where you're being told that there's a disaster coming your way. Get ready for it and you've got a lot of planning time, a lot of planning opportunity. So our incident management team uh, took advantage of that. They activated on Monday morning and they started having twice daily planning sessions. Uh, and for the artificialities of the exercise, we actually received patients on the fourth day. But we found that that planning time was invaluable. Um, we were able to do a lot of staff preparation. Uh, we were able to alleviate a lot of staff fears by doing a lot of just-in-time training, uh, reassuring the staff that these patients had primarily been deconned at the scene or at the first triage site uh, at the site of the incident, and that we would be prepared to validate and confirm that they had in fact been decontaminated and if we found any, any contamination on those patients they would go through our own decontamination process before our staff was exposed to them. In this scenario NDMS actually flew the patients via military aircraft from Florida into a pre-identified patient reception area that's managed by NDMS and uh, specifically by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, Forsyth County EMS cooperates with us and they provided the ground transportation from the patient reception area to Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. We're very fortunate in this area that Forsyth County EMS has a mass casualty transit bus that is um, actually a very large scale ambulance that's capable of carrying up to 21 stretcher patients. So a mass casualty ambulance bus has its pros and cons. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to transport 21 people at a time, uh, up to 28 if they happen to be ambulatory. Uh, and, and that decreases the burden and the taxation on the ambulance service itself. However, it puts the emergency department in the position of receiving 21 to 28 patients all at one time. So that it's incumbent upon the emergency department to develop a plan whereby they can take those patients as they disembark from the bus and get them moved immediately into a first triage and then into a survey area where they're actually confirmed that either they do or do not have radiation contamination. Uh, those that are contaminated are then moved into a decon area and completely decontaminated those who are surveyed and found to be clear of any kind of contamination continue on through a secondary triage and into the emergency department treatment process. In events such as this, there's a lot of uncertainty. This is not an everyday event. Staff themselves will have anxiety. They'll be concerned about treating these patients. Are they putting themselves at risk? Would they be taking home something to their families that would put them at risk? And we must have the opportunity to have real time instruction with our staff to say, you are going to treat these patients in a safe manner. We're going to protect you and we're going to provide you with what you need to be protected. Such things as explaining how close should you be to that patient? Should it be three feet? Should it be more than three feet? How close do you need to be to them if they need to be decontaminated? And how much is the half-life of the radiation injury um, substance that would cause us to have concern? We did that training real time with our staff. We provided that information for them. We allayed their fears and we promised that we would keep them safe when they were treating those patients. Uh, we did things such as draw an outline three feet away from where the patients were going to be housed so that we would know, here's your line of demarcation. Don't cross it unless you have to.
We provided them information on the half-life of cesium so they would understand how far out are we from that and how much more radioactive are they. Uh, we had Geiger counters at, at several locations and we explained to staff how we would assess those patients once they arrived to us. It is a concern because our number one priority is patient care, but very close to that is keeping our team safe. Without our team being safe, we are not able to care for these patients. On this exercise, what we did was patients arrived, they've already been decontaminated at the, uh, at the site where the accident happened, or before they, at least before they got to the hospital. When they arrived here, we used the radiological monitors to verify they've been decontaminated. There's a few. We went ahead and ran through um, the decontamination to verify that the decontamination had taken place. So once the decontamination has been done, we treat them just like any other patient of a major disaster or, or accident for that matter. We're going to look at their ABCs, assess their airway, their breathing, and their circulation. And we'll treat that just like any other patient. Once we look at their airway and their breathing and their circulation, we'll also look for any signs of acute radiation sickness, which can be headache, mental status changes, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, it's important to look for those signs and symptoms because if they have a symptoms of acute radiation sickness within a few hours of the exposure, that could pose or signify a lethal amount of radiation exposure. As I was saying, we treat the ABCs look for acute signs of radiation sickness. Also, if they don't have acute signs of radiation sickness, or actually if they do or don't, we're going to send white cell count to get an idea of if there's bone marrow suppression and how much exposure they've had. And once we've cleared them of any major traumatic injuries, we really want to get those patients to the cancer center because there's a good chance they could have some bone marrow suppression. One of the reasons these patients are coming here is for the treatment at the cancer center at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. From the time the patients arrived to the emergency room and are identified as potential blood marrow transplant patients, our BMT team is notified and will go to the ER and help um, assign a correct disposition for these folks to our um, comprehensive cancer center where they will be classified into one of three categories. The first of these categories are the patients that meet blood marrow transplant criteria upon presentation. The second category are the patients who, who don't currently meet criteria for blood marrow transplant but have that potential and may escalate to need that service, um, who are too sick to maybe go home, so we would watch those. And the third set are the patients that can be managed in the outpatient setting. If a Category 1 patient is identified, uh, these are the patients that need the donor cells, either from a related or unrelated donor. Um, and if the patient volume was high enough, we would utilize NMDP and RITN resources to help us manage that donor pool. If a Category 2 patient is recognized, depending on the reason that they are not a transplant candidate, if that's trauma or just counts where we don't need them to be right now, we would co-manage that patient with consulting physicians to ensure that we're maximizing their medical coverage and, and ensuring that we're meeting all of their medical needs. And if a Category 3 patient is identified, we would refer them to the outpatient setting and our facility here has a large outpatient clinic that could um, adequately supply care for these folks. Uh, we also recognize that there might be a situation involved that would require community resources to help deal with some of disposition problems with families and they might be displaced due to the event. Uh, we have social workers and cancer patient support here to help us identify community resources to obtain the, those patient needs and, and get those, those folks what they need while they're in the community. In a situation like this, some of the challenges in identifying donors are created when the incident occurs in, in a different state or the person is from a different state that's been impacted and their family is there, particularly if we're trying to find a related donor. Um, so those issues then become trying to locate that donor and a valid address um, or a valid telephone number for us to try to contact them to let them know that we are looking for them to be typed their availability, their willingness, if they actually match, um, the speed of the HLA results or the tissue typing, and um, just an overall 
communication and throughput for that process can become compromised, especially if it's a large volume incident. Um, this is where you would utilize the RITN or NMDP network to help you manage that donor pool. There are not very many disaster scenarios where you have the luxury of planning the response immediately before you walk into the situation. So it was an invaluable learning experience for us. The gauge of success of any emergency management exercise is whether or not there were uh, strengths identified, whether or not there were weaknesses identified, and whether or not there are corrective action plans that come out of the exercise. To that end, we feel this was a very, very successful exercise. We did identify some strengths, we did identify some weaknesses, and corrective action plans have been developed. We would like to thank the entire staff of Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, the Forsyth County EMS staff, our federal coordinating center with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and particularly RITN for inviting us to host this exercise.